Hi, I'm Carol Carlson, and today I'm going to read to you from Oziana, 1986, Santa Claus in Oz. It was written and illustrated by Tim Hollis. And it may seem odd to be reading a book about a story about Santa Claus at this time of year, but just listen. It was a beautiful June day. The weather was positively balmy, only 10 degrees below zero. Strange, you say? Well, not particularly. At the North Pole, 10 below is considered a heat wave. And in his great castle, the North Pole's number one citizen, Mr. Santa Nicholas Claus, was sitting in his favorite easy chair, fanning himself. Now, you must know that the summer is when Santa is really at his busiest, for it takes all of the year's 364 days to prepare for that one 365th night when he ventures out on his annual mission of good cheer. Of course, his personal workload is greatly diminished from the days when he had to do all the toy making himself. His staff of over 100 elves is hard to beat for efficiency, and they have not yet run behind on their grueling spirit schedule, not until this particular summer day. Santa's leisure time was rudely interrupted by a knock at his study door. Come in, he said, his usual jollity missing from his voice. The sweltering weather had made him feel most stuffy and uncomfortable. Sir Cedric Cedric had fallen elf reporting, sir, said the red and green costumed elf who entered. Oh, yes, the weekly report, mumbled Santa, sipping his iced tea. Well, let's get it over with. It's hard for me to have much Christmas spirit during this heat wave, don't you know? Yes, it is rather warm, agreed Sir Cedric. In fact, the latest weather report said that tomorrow the temperature would go to at least three above. There's Santa sweltering in the heat wave. Great bouncing icebergs, moaned Santa. Much more of this, and I'm going to have to give in and buy a swimsuit. All right, Cedric, let's hear your report. Everything running on schedule, I trust? Um, well, there is a problem, sir, fumbled Sir Cedric. Production seems to be running a bit slow this year. Out of the projected final total of 1,365,624,717 toys, we have only finished um, about 2,000. 2,000, exclaimed Sir St. Nicholas, for Christmas sake, Cedric, it's half past June already. What are you fellas waiting for, Thanksgiving? But, sir, pleaded the miserable elf, you, you don't know what it's like back there in the workshop. Those 2,000 toys we finished take up all the space, and there's hardly enough room to breathe. Hmm, and this hot weather is making the elves cranky and irritable. But just this moment, morning, two of the new recruits got angry and started beating each other over the head with candy canes. And when it rains, the roof leaks. And the floor has warped. The boards need replacing. And But now, by now the exhausted Cedric was reduced to a quivering heap on the floor. There, there, comforted Santa with all the gentleness with which he was famous. I admit I haven't visited the workshop in quite a while, but if things are really that bad, there's only one thing to do. Remodel. Re re remodel? Said Cedric. Indeed, and while we're at it, we'll have the whole place redone. My workshop, my castle, the reindeer stables, even Frosty the Snowman's igloo. Everything will be brand spanking new. But, but boss, pointed out Sir Cedric, we're, we're far enough behind schedule as it is. If we take time off for remodeling, we'll never have the toys finished by Christmas Eve. Well, then we'll just have to find some place to work while the remodeling is going on. declared S.C. Let's see, it, it must be somewhere the public can't get to, or we'll be swamped with visitors from now on. Where? Where? And just then his eye fell on a tiny green Christmas tree. 
sitting on the mantel. It was carved from an emerald. Emerald, he yelled. Emerald, the Emerald City, the Land of Oz. Where else? Land of Oz, sir, asked Cedric, who was always rather skeptical of anything different. Of course, said old Santa. I visit there every Christmas day. I even used to live right across the des deadly desert from Oz. You did? asked the head elf. You see, since Santa had always been a bit hazy about his past, most of the elves had never heard of his early life. Well, of course I did. It was a little place called Laughing Valley. Oh, I guess you've never heard of the spot, he added, seeing Cedric's puzzled look. That was a, a long time before you chaps came to work for me. I lived in that valley for hundreds of years, but it got so crowded that I had to move my whole operation up here to the pole to have enough room. Do you really think that Ozma will let us set up in her country? asked Cedric. I'm positive of it. She's never turned me down before. I'll get in touch with her right away. Meanwhile, you get back to the workshop and tell the other elves to start packing everything into some of those empty gift boxes. We leave for the Emerald City tomorrow morning. And as the tubby elf waddled away to tell the others, Santa picked up his phone and dialed for the operator. North Pole Telephone System. Operator Ugly Bugly speaking, said the Eskimo operator. Get me Ozma's palace in the Emerald City of Oz at once, ordered Santa. I'm sorry, but Ozma's palace has an unlisted number, said the operator. In fact, it doesn't even have a phone. There are no phones in the land of Oz. Well, I'll fix that, decided Santa. He laid his finger beside his nose and gave a nod. Meanwhile, in Ozma's throne room, the ruler of Oz was conferring with Professor Wogglebug about some new Emerald City building codes. All of a sudden, a bell rang under Ozma's throne. Oh my goodness, she gasped, jumping out of the overstuffed chair. What was that? Sounds like a telephone, said the educated insect who knew all about such things. A what? But never mind, I'll answer it, interrupted the big bug. Hello, Queen Ozma's palace. He answered, pulling out the green phone that had mysteriously appeared under the throne. Ho, 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 it's Santa Claus. I would like to speak to Ozma, please, said the jolly voice at the other end of the line. It's for you, your majesty, the wogglebug said in his dry voice. Some joker who says he's Santa Claus. <laughs> Santa Claus. <laughs> and the insect crept off into the corner and began making odd sounds. Ozma had never seen a telephone before, but following the Wogglebug's example, she took the receiver. Hello, she said. Ozma, shouted jolly old Saint Nick. It's me, Santa Claus. Oh, my, yes, I, I recognize the voice, said Ozma, getting rather excited. But why are you calling me at this time of year? Santa explained the predicament that he was in, pausing occasionally to ho, 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 or to wish Ozma a Merry Christmas, forgetting that Christmas was months away. But Ozma finally got the idea of what the Yuletide Jet was trying to say. Well, we'd be delighted to have you work here, Ozma declared. We have many rooms in the palace that aren't even needed. There'll be plenty of space for your elves to work. And what about my reindeer? asked Santa. Oh, there's lots of room in the royal stable. I'm sure that the Cowardly Lion and the others won't mind sharing their space a bit. One more thing. Uh, what about Frosty the Snowman? I'd have to bring him with me and... He melts whenever he gets too far away from the North Pole. We have some refrigerated rooms down in the palace basement where the cooks store their supplies, Ozma mused. Maybe Frosty can move into one of them. Oh, excellent, excellent, laughed Santa. We'll be flying into the city first thing tomorrow morning. Ozma gulped, but quickly changed it to a cough. <laughs> uh, Merry Christmas. <laughs> All right, she said, wondering how they would ever get ready in time. We'll have a welcoming committee on the roof of the palace to greet you. Uh, thanks. I'll see you then, concluded Claus. Merry Christmas, he added for the umpteenth time before he hung up. Early the next morning, a group of the Emerald City's most famous celebrities climbed the long flight of stairs up to the roof of the huge palace. Arriving there, they all began to scan the skies for a sign of Santa's flying sleigh. 
being up here reminds me of old times, remarked the brainy scarecrow. I remember when we were trapped up here and had to use the gump to escape. Oh, that was indeed a most memorable occasion, said the Wogglebug. But for my part, I wouldn't go back to those days. For a whole hat full of golden guineas, I would not. By this time, a huge crowd of people had also gathered in the palace courtyard to wait for Santa's arrival, and the many different shades of green made a most lovely sight. I still don't see any sign of the sleigh, announced the Tin Woodman, shading his tin eyes with his hand. I could hardly wait put in Jack Pumpkinhead in his dense voice. I wonder if he'll bring us any colored eggs before the erudite. Wogglebug could say what he was starting to say. Captain Salt yelled, Ahoy! There he is, due north! A cheer went up from the gathered throngs, both on the roof and on the ground, as Santa's magnificent procession swept down out of the sky. Leading the way was that glowing personality, Rudolph, the red-nosed reindeer. The eight not-as-bright reindeer followed, and then came Santa's huge red and green sleigh. Santa himself was seated right up front, grasping the reins with one hand and waving to with all with the other until it looked like his arm was going to fall off. Sitting right beside S.C. was Mrs. Claus, the kindliest-looking grandmotherly-type lady anyone ever ever saw. In the back seat of the sleigh was Sir Cedric, Cedric, using a huge fan to keep Frosty the snowman cool. Frosty looked extremely nervous, owing to the fact that June weather, especially in Oz, didn't suit him at all. But he continued to smile and tip his black silk hat. Trailing after the sleigh were four wagons, each one loaded with elves, toy-making equipment, and all the toys that had been completed up to that date. The sleigh and wagons circled once or twice, then gently came to a gliding halt on the roof. Immediately, Santa sprang from his seat and began shaking hands all around. Frosty lumbered out of the back of the sleigh, and after remarking that it wouldn't be long before he'd be making a big splash in the world, he was escorted off to the freezers by Ozma's quickest servants. Oh, what a pleasure it is to be here with all of my old friends, exclaimed Santa. Why, by living here for the summer, it'll be like Christmas in July. Oh, oh, oh Christmas in July, yes, indeed. Uh, did you bring me any colored eggs, shouted Jack Pumpkinhead. It looked like it was long past time for him to get a new head. Um, Mr. Claus, exactly what is the economic setup of your workshop, asked the little bug. How fast can your reindeer run? cried the sawhorse, who had more than a passing interest in things of that sort. Methinks I could use a new yellow suit of armor come this Christmas, boomed the yellow knight. The more you bring me, the better, put in the knight's helper, Wilbur Kennard. Santa never once lost his trademark jollity throughout these tiresome questions, but he finally climbed into the sleigh and shook the bells on the reins for attention. I really would like nothing better than to stay here with you and converse, he said, but my work schedule is running further behind by the minute. You must excuse me while I set up my operation. Everyone realized that for all his good humor, Santa was really a very busy man, so they all made their way back downstairs with Jack Pumpkinhead still loudly asking for his colored eggs. At last, Santa and his staff were left alone on the roof. What friendly people, sighed Santa, but we must get back to work. You elves, back there, gather up those tools and follow me. Santa took the elves to a suite of rooms on the second floor of the palace, which was quite vacant and free from disturbance. Ozma had thoughtfully had long tables placed in the huge rooms, so within an hour the quick-working elves were hammering, sawing, and painting away. Next, Santa and Cedric unhitched the reindeer and led all nine of them off to the stables behind the palace. The sight of the fat deer made the hungry tiger drool a bit, but fortunately he managed to keep his appetite under control. The cowardly lion trembled a bit at sharing his stall with a reindeer whose red nose blinked on and off all night long, but Rudolph was so shy and unassuming that he soon put his leonine stablemate at ease. In fact, the lion slept better than ever now that he had a nightlight. Ozma then met with Santa and Mrs. Claus and led them off to the guest bedroom which was second only to her own in splendor. As it was now fairly late in the day, she wished them a good night and said that she would be happy to talk with them whenever they had the time. And then she went off to her own royal bedroom, leaving Santa and his wife alone. 
isn't this a marvelous palace, Nick? asked Mrs. Claus. She always called him Nick. Yes, but we have at least six months to enjoy it, yawned Santa, unbuttoning his fur trimmed coat. So let's not rush it. We can be perfectly happy here where there is nothing to hinder our progress. But Santa would not have slept so well between his emerald green sheets if he had known what was going to happen between that time and the day he left on his yearly rounds. Now, Ruggedoo, the long dethroned gnome king, had never been famous for his kindly disposition, and so he was the only person in the Emerald City who greeted the news of Santa's arrival with disgust. After his latest epic misadventure, he'd been placed in care of the Emerald City Miniature Golf Course, a post which he hated. Not only did he have to grin and chuckle at children all day long, but he had to listen to them cheer and yell whenever one of them knocked the golf ball into his mouth. Well, actually, it was only a statue of himself, but he felt humiliated. Nevertheless, so it was no wonder that he spent all his free time ranting and raving like a grumpy gorilla. Curses, he fumed one evening. That idiot Santa Claus loves those little brats so much, and they think he is the tops. I hate him to death, and I can't do a thing about it. He tore off his candy-striped uniform and stomped on it in a rage. I hate children. I hate Christmas. I hate Santa Claus. I... Suddenly he stopped, and a most calculating look came into his beady red eyes. Wait a minute, he growled. What's the matter with me, wife? This is great. Stupendous! I have that goody two-shoe St. Nick and his crummy helpers right where I want them. If I can wreck his plans for Christmas, it'll disappoint the kids so much they'll never get over it. They'll be as miserable as I want them to be. <laughs> the next morning, when the elves trooped down the green hallway toward their makeshift workrooms, the nasty gnome was peering out from behind a large post. And when the last elf in line, a new fellow named Jeepers, marched by, Ruggedoo whispered, Hey, you! Who, me? said Jeepers. Come here a minute, leered Santa. Jeepers went round behind the post. Wham! A few minutes later, another elf wearing the familiar red and green outfit joined the others. True, he was scrawnier and had more unkempt hair than most, and his face was a different color. But... The bogus sprite Ruggedo managed to make himself as inconspicuous as possible. While working on a lovely little doll, Ruggedo said out loud, Oh, what a pretty doll. I'd just love to hug it. He squeezed it so hard, all the seams popped and sawdust squirted everywhere. When hammering on a toy truck, he made sure to pound hard enough that the toy was crushed into a wad of wrinkled scrap. While sewing on a teddy bear, it was Ruggedo's idea to equip the toy with claws fangs, and an expression that's scary enough to frighten crack Count Dracula. Thus, the old gnome managed to work his own special talent in the toy-making department. However, that was only phase one of Ruggedo's master plan. In his purloined elf getup, the old miscreant had free run of the palace, although he went to great lengths to ensure that Ozma, or anyone else who might recognize him, never saw him. Whenever any of his old enemies would come around, he would manage to have a pile of toys or ornaments in front of his face. By September, his subversive tactics had managed to slow production down a bit, but not enough. So he turned to Santa's other activities, in addition to his career in the toy department. He slunk down to the palace kitchen, where Mrs. Claus was busy supervising the making of candy canes, Christmas cookies, chocolate Santas, and other holiday treats. When no one was looking, he made a few changes. He had put salt in the sugar bowl, put flies in the raisin cookies, and replaced the chocolate Santa molds with chocolate spider molds. Every time Mrs. Claus threw out another batch of ruined goodies, Ruggedoo would laugh delightedly, <laughs> especially as the trash hoop heap grew larger and the pile of acceptable candies hardly grew at all. While in the kitchens, the rotten old creature got another fiendish idea. I think I might get an idea from that oaf, Frosty the Snowman, Ruggedo muttered. That hat of his is magic. It brought him to life. 
It ought to bring anything else to life, too. I think I'll build an evil helper for myself. Not having any snow to work with, Ruggedoo scooped up a pile of Oz cream and fashioned a hideous monster out of it. And then he crept off to Frosty's freezer and knocked. Come on in, called the jolly snowman. Hi, Frosty, continued Ruggedoo in his bony, sweet voice. Oh, wow, that's a nice hat you're wearing today. Huh? said Frosty, scratching his cold head. This is the same hat I've been wearing every day for the past 30-odd years. Odd is right, you moron, mumbled Ruggedoo. Or that is, I'd love to have a closer look at your chapeau. I don't have a chapeau. All I've got is my magic hat. It's what keeps me alive, you know. Well, what would happen to you without it? Cleared the bogus elf. Oh, that's too terrible to think about, concluded Frost. Frosty turning his back. The minute he wasn't looking, Ruggedoo made a flying leap and knocked the hat from Frosty's head. Well, immediately a strange thing happened. Frosty stiffened. His arms and legs disappeared. His eyes turned into lumps of coal, and before he could say jolly happy soul, Ruggedo was staring at a crudely fashioned, unalive snowman there in the freezer. Snickering like a fiend, Ruggedo ran with the hat to the Oz cream freezer where he had left his lifeless monster. Without further ado, he popped the top hat onto the monster's head, but Ruggedo wasn't prepared for what happened next. The monster let out one horrible roar, grabbed the startled gnome, and started beating the cookies out of him. Ruggedo very nearly became a gnome pancake before he could snatch back the hat, depriving his creation of its life. Shaking all over, from fright as well as from the temperature in the freezer, Ruggedo dropped the hat and tottered off to his hut behind the miniature golf course for the rest of that day. Mrs. Claus found Frosty's hat in the freezer and, recognizing it at once, turned it over to the genial snowman's room. She popped the silk topper on the frozen figure's head and Frosty immediately came to life again. He'll never believe this, Frosty told her, but one of Santa's elves just stole my hat. You're right, Mrs. Claus said. I don't believe you. Which one of them would do a thing like that? Which one, indeed? Time is this one. March done. Before anyone was ready for it, it was Christmas Eve. And time for the sinister gnome to complete his dirty work. Being December 24th, Ozma had invited Santa and his staff to a huge Christmas party with all of her celebrity friends. Of course, Ruggedo and his elf suit was able to to infiltrate the gathering. My dear Mr. Claus, the scarecrow was asking St. Nick, how did you manage to stay awake all night on Christmas Eve when you are a human being just like all these other unfortunates? Oh, I never have any trouble, laughed Claus. I've been at it so long, I don't think anything could make me sleep on this night. That's what you think, fatty, Ruggedo muttered while secretly taking a bottle of essence of poppies out of his pocket and dumping it into Santa's cup of eggnog on the table. How long does it take you to deliver all them colored eggs, Jack Pumpkinhead wanted to know. I beg your pardon? I said, one minute, my melon-topped friend. I simply must quench my thirst. Santa alibied, reaching for this eggnog. Santa, grup Santa gulped down the beverage and then announced, Well, folks, I've got to get up to my room and make some last-minute preparations. Flight plans and all, you know. See you in the morning. <laughs> Whistling jingle bells, Santa waddled to the bedroom, but five steps into the room, the essence of poppies took effect. Santa's eyes crossed, his beard stood on end, and with a mighty thud, he plopped over onto bed and was snoring like a grampus. It worked. It worked, raved Grumpadoo in a perfectly maniacal glee. Now to fix Christmas once and for all. He tore down the hall to the room where all the toys were waiting to be loaded onto the sleigh. Grabbing an axe he had conveniently hidden, Ruggedoo went to work and had soon chopped each and every toy into so many pieces that even all the elves plus the seven dwarfs wouldn't have been able to put them back together. He was just about to start pounding on the sleigh when he heard a noise by the door that led to the outside. He cringed expecting to be discovered. But no, all he heard, heard were some children's voices singing, Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, 
bah, under the sky. It's just some kids in their Merry Christmas tripe. Well, I say, booey to them. He raised his axe to begin converting the sleigh into scrap metal, but as dry as he would, he could not keep from hearing the carolers. Sleep in heavenly peace. Sleep in heavenly peace. What's the matter with me? He blustered as the axe dropped from his hand. I must be getting soft. I, I gotta get a hold of myself. I, I just can't do it. He screamed and started pounding on the floor with his twisted fist. Those kids haven't ever done anything to me. I can't let them down this way. Stopping his blubbering, he looked around. Oh no, what have I done? He gasped, picking up several hundred pieces of toys in one hand. They're destroyed, wiped out. Oh, he tore out his white hair in anguish. Oh, if I could only remember my magic for putting things back together again. And what happened next, even Ozma could never explain. Perhaps it was because for once the old gnome was thinking of someone besides himself, or maybe it was a Christmas miracle, but suddenly the right magic words came to Ruggedoo. They rolled off his tongue before he could even think, and before he could say Santa Claus is coming to town, the sleigh was piled high with sparkling new toys. Akado, elated, ran out of the trash pile where the remains of several months of ruined candies were, and after a few magic words, the goodies looked as delicious as ever. And then the changed gnome dashed up to Santa's room. Wake up, he yelled into Santa's ear, pulling the fat man with all his might. But the essence of poppies was strong stuff, and Santa was sleeping sounder than a floundered flounder. What now, gulped Droigadoo, and then another inspiration hit him. He wrestled S.C. out of his red and white suit, and put it on himself. Amazingly, the outfit conformed itself to his own shape, and if he'd been a little taller, Ruggedo could have passed himself off as the real thing to anyone. He ran down to the sleigh, quickly harnessed the reindeer, and yelped to Rudolph, to the top of the parapet, to the top of the wall, now dash away, dash away, dash away all. The huge doors swung open, and the amazing deer flew away into the night sky with the sleigh and its crooked old driver following behind. As the sleigh circled the entire earth that Christmas Eve night, it seemed that Ruggedo would never get tired of yelling, ho, 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 Merry Christmas to all. And he meant it. Things started jumping back in the Emerald City about three in the morning when Ozma escorted Mrs. Claus back to her bedroom. There they found Santa snoring away like Rip Van Winkle. Yay! Ozma screamed, what? Who? We must wake him up. Wake up, Nick, Mrs. Claus shouted, shaking her rotund hubby for all she was worth. Santa stirred a little, but all he mumbled was, ho, 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 happy Easter, and then dropped off again. Well, needless to say, panic prevailed, and when the word reached the throngs of the banquet hall, and by the time everyone had stopped yelling at each other long enough to decide what to do, the sun was beginning to peek over the treetops. Just as Ozma was getting up on her throne to make a royal decision, she was interrupted by the sound of sleigh bells on the roof and a noise in the chimney. Then before everyone startled eyes, out of the fireplace crawled the beaming Ruggedo and, a, and his empty toy sack. The Yellow Knight and other hardy souls rushed over to seize him, but the gnome motioned the back. Going over to Ozma and grasping both her hands, the old gnome said, My dear, I know I've caused a lot of trouble in the past, and right now I could do any horrible thing I wanted to you, but not on Christmas Day. Merry Christmas, my dear Ozma. Merry Christmas, one and all. And no one could quite believe their ears, but it was true. There was Ruggedo in his Santa suit, actually shaking hands and giving out presents all around. He seemed like the jolliest fellow since Santa himself. But here's the rest of the story. The day after Christmas, Ozma and Santa, who was most relieved, not to mention well-rested, went looking for Ruggedo and found him sulking in his cabin. Well, what do you want, he snarled as they came in. Ozma and Santa exclaimed unsurprised glances as they recognized the Ruggedo that they were accustomed to. 
my elves inform me that you've been wearing one of their suits for the past six months, Santa said. Well, so what about it? They said you made such a splendid elf. I should take you back to the North Pole with me to work all year long, announced Santa with a twinkle in his eye. And I have given him permission to take you, said Ozma, shooting Santa an equally impish wink. What? roared the furious old gnome. I won't do it. You can't make me. I hate toys. I hate kids. I hate Christmas. I hate. But Santa's and Ozma's minds were made up. So that afternoon, when Santa and his staff loaded into their wagons for the long trip back to the pole, five of the strongest elves were kept busy holding the squirming Ruggedo in the last wagon. With a smile and a wave to all, Santa snapped the reins, and the whole procession rose up into the air. Even after the sleigh and the wagons were just a speck in the sky, everyone could still hear Ruggedo yelling, I won't go! You can't make me! I'll fix you! But there's some more. A few weeks later, the telephone under Ozma's throne rang again. A high-pitched voice said, Hello, Ozma! This is your subject, the Easter Bunny. My underground kingdom is being made floodproof. And I was wondering if my staff could set up its operations in the Emerald City until after Easter. When Jack Pumpkin heard about this, he was delighted. Oh boy, the Easter Bunny. I can hardly wait to see him decorate a few trees and give out some candy canes. I just love holidays. The end. Thank you for listening.